It's Wednesday, June 8. In the headlines, a committee to be established to guide Jamaica's transition to republic status. Regionally suspected case of monkeypox in the Bahamas. And in sports, reggae boys level up over Suriname on Tuesday. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. Jamaica will have to wait until 2025 to decide on fundamental constitutional reforms. The announcement came from Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs Marlene Malahu Fort as she made her maiden sectoral debate presentation under this portfolio in the House of Representatives on a Tuesday. Carla Thomas Hewitt has the story. A Constitutional Reform Committee, CRC, which will include representatives from the government, parliamentary opposition, experts and the wider society is to be appointed to ensure Jamaica transitions smoothly to a republic. I have set out the work to be done by the committee in very broad terms, specifying among other things that it will involve at this stage the conduct of a thorough and comprehensive review of the 1962 constitution including the 2011 Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, as well as recommendations for reform made through the various constitutional reform commissions and committees in the past. Ultimately, to implement an ambitious reform agenda settled by consensus. And I've said that the ultimate goal is a constitution enacted by the Parliament of Jamaica. Before Jamaica can become a republic, a referendum is required, and she is hoping that this can be done by the next general elections. Mrs. Malahu Ford clarified for the opposition leader that this route being taken is not to delay the transition. For Jamaica to become a republic have already been agreed by the two major political parties, arising from the extensive constitutional reform, consultative processes over the past 25 years, and you've also said that the required legislative research has already been done. I take no issue with you because it is true that much work has been done. But it is also true, it is also true that important substantive issues are yet to be settled. And these are the more difficult issues because not only government and parliamentary opposition must be on the same page, but the people. I think collectively as a nation, we need consensus on the direction we want to go in. It doesn't now exist. Meanwhile, Mrs. Malahu Fort noted that there are many steps to take between now and the tabling of a new constitution. She will advise when the committee is fully constituted and will keep everyone up to date on the progress made. She added that it is her intention in leading the progress to work assiduously to place something before the parliament. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs is working towards establishing a comprehensive Jamaica Legal Information Portal, JLIP. Portfolio Minister Marlene Malahu Fort says the portal will reduce the extensive time and effort extended to identifying Gazette notices and laws. She says the work is being done in partnership with the Jamaica Promotions Corporation, JAMPRO. Right now, Madam Speaker, I take no pleasure in saying ministries do not have a compilation of ministerial orders and legal officers do not know where to find the gazettes with them. The goal is to have a dedicated website where the acts passed by parliament and the subsidiary legislation can be published and circulated in a searchable database which also includes sunset legislation and repealed acts of Jamaica as well as gazettes containing legal notices and other relevant matters. 
She says funding will be provided by the World Bank Group. No longer will the extensive will extensive time and effort be expended to identify gazette notices and laws. Once implemented, yeah. you will be able to get them right away. Yes. Madam Speaker. The ministry intends to use the web portal to engage on law reform issues. This engagement will serve to inform both the public and the ministry itself about the issues of concerns that are to be considered in the development of law reform proposals. Mrs. Malahufort was making her contribution to the 2022-23 sectorial debate in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. Reporting for the news on BBC Jamaica, I am Carla thomas Hewitt. Prime Minister Andrew Holness left the island on Tuesday to participate in the Summit of the Americas in the United States. The event, which brings together the political leaders from the Caribbean, North, Central and South America, is to run from June 6 to June 10. A statement from the Office of the Prime Minister states that Mr. Holness is expected to address a session at the summit and hold bilateral discussions. Several CARICOM leaders have been leaving for the U.S. amid a call for a boycott of the event over the exclusion of Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela. Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Suriname have publicly announced their attendance. St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonzalez confirmed last Wednesday that neither he nor any other government minister will be attending. Other countries in the Americas, including Mexico, have raised concerns regarding their participation at the deliberations, insisting that the summit should be inclusive and not exclusive. Mr. Holness is expected to return on June 11. During his absence, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Security Dr. Horace Chang will be in charge of government. A new bail act is coming soon with stiffer penalties for those accused of murder. I want everybody to hear me well. Madam Speaker, if you on murder charge, you cannot be at large. If you on gun charge, you cannot be at large. The bail act will come shortly. That was the warning given as government gets ready to bring to Parliament a new bail act. While stating that the act would have been tabled on Tuesday, Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs Marlene Malahufort shared that changes to the wording of some clauses were being made. Under the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms in the Constitution, any person awaiting trial and detained in custody shall be entitled to bail on reasonable conditions unless sufficient cause is shown for keeping him in custody. The change would satisfy members of the security forces who have complained about the role of accused criminals on bail being key perpetrators of crimes. Jamaica has one of the highest murder rates in the world, with over 40 per 100,000 of the population killed yearly. Commissioner of Police Major General Anthony Anderson says plans are well advanced to increase the number of quick response teams in western Jamaica. Speaking at a virtual media briefing on Tuesday, Major General Anderson said his team in St. Elizabeth has already been expanded. And plans are well advanced to establish quick response teams in the other parishes out west. There are 60 members currently under training ahead of being deployed to Area 1, and this is advanced tactical training. And this will significantly boost our capacity and ability to respond to the challenges we are having in the Western Division. Last financial year, we recruited 1,260 officers, and this year we are on course to recruit a similar number. We are increasing not only the number, but the quality of these officers. Now, the proliferation of weapons and the propensity for gunmen to attack each other makes it unlikely to in intercept every gunman. He says recent arrests are proof that police investigation and intelligence have improved alongside community cooperation. Our model of policing is an integrated one, and we continue to engage in a wide array of initiatives geared at opening channels of communication and building trust. 
These trust-building initiatives have been important to the improved intelligence and investigative capacity that we have spoken of. Our aggressive digital media strategy continues to reap rewards in the improved trust that people place in us. Share information with Crime Stop as well as sharing with police in the local division. So far this year, calls to Crime Stop have increased by 98% over last year. Our engagement on Facebook increased by 156%. We have 30,000 new active followers on Instagram and 25,000 on Twitter. He says firearms recovery have increased in the last month when compared to the time period last year. As at May 31st, the JCF uh, have seized 320 illegal firearms compared with 314 recorded last year representing a 2% increase in firearm seizures. Since then, and this is the first uh, seven days of June, we, seized, we have seized 27 firearms during police operations, compared with nine during the similar period last year. In addition, we have seized 6,380 rounds of ammunition when compared to 4,000 483 in the similar period in 2021. This represents a 42% increase in ammunition seizure. As the fight for sustainable development continues, a panel discussion was held with the European Union delegation to discuss the importance of their partnership with Jamaica and working towards a climate resilience. Denita Rodney reports. As the fight for sustainable development continues, a panel discussion was held with the European Union delegation to discuss the importance of their partnership to Jamaica and working towards climate resilience. When asked where the government ranks climate change, Chief Technical Director at the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Gillian Guthrie, answered that it was a top priority. For the government of Jamaica, the climate change issue and the agenda is priority number one. Uh, we believe that this particular issue is the foundation of um, economic growth and development and social well-being. Um, if we don't get the climate change agenda right, then the economy will also be impacted negatively and so will the quality of life that all Jamaicans experience. So EU Delegate Marion Van Steen mentioned that one of the important aspects of the EU-Jamaica partnership is working together to ensure the necessary financing would be available. What is very important that the European Union finds a very important ally in Jamaica at the multilateral level. We've seen um, even special recognition of um, the work of the Prime Minister who was selected after the Paris Agreement as well um, to kind of lobby and work together with governments and um, the private sector to make sure that the financing would be on the table. I think that is very important. We've also seen the commitment of um, the Prime Minister and of course the entire team, the government, Minister Samoda, to really um, have climate change very high on the agenda. This was a sentiment that Professor Dale Weber of the Climate Change Advisory Board agreed with. It demonstrates a willingness and a commitment, but it also provides the ammunition and energy so that we can take the steps that we would always like to take. The, very often we make plans, but we're unable to execute. It is through partnerships that we have the opportunity so to do, and the European Union partnership is one very strong partnership that has taken us far down the road in areas that we thought we were not going to go before. Time now for the Business Report with Danita Rodney. In foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, June 7, the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $154.49. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $123.03. The pound sterling traded for $194.60. And the euro sold for an average of $165.94. The following reflects the movement of the JSE indices in Tuesday's trading session. The JSE index declined by 4100 103 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index declined by 84 points to close at over 4,000 units. 
The combined market index declined by 4,591 points to close at over 300,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 4,175 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 102 stocks of which 20 advanced, 63 declined and 19 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, CAC 2000 9.5% Cumulative Redeemable Preference Shares and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Stocks declined for Access Financial Services Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Caribbean Cream Limited, and First Rock Capital Holdings Limited USD. The following companies represent the overall volume leaders Trans Jamaican Highway Limited and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited USD with over 2 million units, and Jamaican Tees Limited with over 1 million units. In regional stocks in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Macro Index Fund was the volume leader with over 1,000 shares, followed by Clico Investment Fund with 291 shares being traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Government of Barbados Bond Series B was the volume leader with over 88,000 shares, followed by Goddard Enterprises Limited which traded over 32,000 shares and First Caribbean International Bank with over 500 shares. In international news, venture capital funding in Africa has grown massively over the last decade, and yet many fail to see the power and potential that exists within the continent, especially when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. But business leaders in South Africa are looking to change that. More from Al Jazeera News. Known as South Africa's Silicon Valley, Cape Town has long attracted foreigners with its pristine beaches, laid-back lifestyle, and vibrant culture. But as tech hubs emerge and the cost of living soars, there's a crucial need to equip the city's youth with the tools necessary to thrive. This newly established hub called Innovation City seeks to accelerate growth among startups by bringing young entrepreneurs of various business interests under the same roof. We were all there trying to figure things out. Its founder, Kino Kamez, says it wouldn't have been as successful pre-pandemic. In a lot of ways, COVID has been one of the best teachers we could have ever had. Never before has the world collaborated the way it has, and it's no different with business. We've got some critical issues that we need to sort out, especially on the African continent. And we can only do that through collaboration. The Norskin Foundation recently launched a $200 million growth fund dedicated to innovative African startups that focus on making a positive impact on the continent. Other VCs are following suit. As the city emerges from lockdown and struggles with a high unemployment rate, places like Innovation City encourages and empowers people to work together across all sectors, leading to greater job creation within the continent. Venture capital funding in Africa hit an all-time high last year, reaching more than $5 billion. But some say the success of a startup depends largely on the one calling the shots. Leadership is a fundamental issue because we've seen the converse of that. We've seen what happens in this continent when you've got dictators, people who don't allow for democratic processes to work or for entrepreneurs to thrive. So leaders need to in some ways clear the path so that successful and talented people can thrive through that. Leaders like the Pauline Masinga were moved to see how the pandemic impacted the lives of those around him. And so the next chapter was born, an event featuring renowned guest speakers to equip young creatives with a business acumen to overcome similar challenges. We refer to ourselves as um, global citizens because through technology, through the internet, we are now part of a global community. We want to take that even further, and we want to be part of the global conversation. A conversation impacting life on the African continent and the way those on the outside view it. <laughs> Jillian Wolf, Al Jazeera, Cape Town. Brent futures were up $1.32 or 1.1% at $121.89 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate Crude was at $120.80 a barrel up $1.39 or 1.2%. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. 
In regional news, we start with the Bahamas. On Tuesday, the Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Michael Darvell, confirmed one suspected case of monkeypox. The minister says the patient, who is in his 40s, arrived in the country several days ago on British Airways. More from our news, Bahamas. I have been informed that there is a potential case, and I want to make that very clear, potential case uh, of monkeypox in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It's a foreign national who came into the country uh, who, exquisite, who presented with signs and symptoms associated uh, with monkeypox. Today, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention urged people to practice enhanced precautions to curtail the outbreak as cases rise globally. The risk to the general public still remains low. However, with just over 1,000 cases across 29 countries, monkeypox symptoms, including rashes, fever, headache, muscle ache, swelling, and back pain. As for the patient, Dr. Darbold says the ministry is trying to confirm his diagnosis. In Grenada, the new National Party political leader, Dr. Keith Mitchell, says the Organization of American States mission is expected to arrive in Grenada within days to observe the country's general elections. However, the government is not afraid of any scrutiny it may bring. sherri Blackman-Stevens has the report. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell has declared that the government is not afraid of any international scrutiny as it relates to the election process. Citizens will go to the polls on June 23rd, and the Prime Minister has confirmed that the Organization of American States is among bodies coming to Grenada to observe elections. The Organization of the American States, the OAS, and the CARICOM community have accepted our invitation to send delegation to the election. We have also sent an invitation to former President Jimmy Carter's center, and they said, they said we'll get back to us very soon. This is expected to come within the next few days. The Prime Minister says his government is committed to free and fair elections. We want the world to see that we are fair, and we believe in the principles of democracy. We in the NNP are not afraid of international observation, sisters and brothers. As it relates to the decision day, Dr. Mitchell responded to the notion that citizens should vote to ensure there is an opposition. Some people are saying they might want to vote because they want to give us a little opposition. Let it be clear. Elections are not about voting for opposition. Elections are about voting for a government. It is about voting for a team that will be ready to take off immediately, sisters and brothers. Marriott International has signed an agreement to bring the Sheraton Hotels and Resorts brands to Georgetown, Guyana. Executive officer at Hits and Jams, Kerwin Bullers, revealed the construction of the two-tower building is valued at some 200 million U.S. dollars. Construction of the Sheraton Hotel and Resort is a joint venture undertaken through an agreement signed by Marriott International with H Towers, Inc., the Trewest Financial Group and Black Pearl Holding Company. The 200-room hotel and 224 residential suites for living will expand the company's existing portfolio here with its extravagant residential, commercial and retail centers, offering guests a variety of experiences to explore. Having international partners is definitely needed because these are some very big projects and um, we need international partners, we need international brands that are recognized worldwide so that when travelers come to Guyana, they know of the standard, they know of these brands. Uh, these brands have been in existence for a very, very long time. So for government to partner um, both with the private sector and also with the overseas investors, I think it, it brings together a great marriage um, for, for a great investment. Buller says the project will create numerous job opportunities for locals in the hospitality sector. They will have a lot of job opportunities from the construction phase 
all the way to um, pre-opening and opening, um, I think is a great initiative. Uh, matter of fact, a great um, outlet for job creation, especially for those persons in the hospitality. The project was in response to an expression of interest launched by GoInvest in 2021 for hotel developers. Construction for the two towers is slated to begin at the end of the year and should be completed for a 2025 opening. Tropical Storm Alex, the first named storm of the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season, lashed Bermuda with heavy rain and strong winds over the weekend. Though lives were lost in Cuba and parts of Florida were left deluged, it didn't leave much damage in Bermuda in its wake. We hear more in this report from Bermuda Broadcasting. What was to become Tropical Storm Alex was partially formed with the remnants of Pacific Hurricane Agatha that battered Mexico at the end of May, causing nine deaths. Only known at the time as potential Tropical Cyclone 1, the system caused flooding in Cuba and Florida, with at least three deaths in Cuba. Bermuda Weather Service began warning us of the potential cyclone on Friday, and by Sunday, Tropical Storm Alex had received its moniker as the first named storm of the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season. On Sunday evening, National Security Minister Michael Weeks announced that, out of an abundance of caution, all schools would be closed on Monday and buses and ferries would be off the road until the afternoon. As Alex approached, rain fell hard for only a short time on Sunday. It's relatively calm right now, but wind speeds increased overnight. The south southwesterly winds might be the coastline here on the south shore. Alex hit the island with its strongest winds while it was at its closest, 100 nautical miles to the north northwest between 9 and 10 a.m. Here at the airport, we the highest winds recorded were about 43 knots sustained with a gust of 54 knots. The Crescent Nav Aid recorded 48 knots sustained with a gust of 63, and that's a hurricane force. The storm managed to put out the lights in some areas, with a peak of around 1,000 reported power outages. In sports, the Reggae Boys came out victorious last night to beat Suriname 3-1 in their second CONCACAF Nations League game at the National Stadium. Goals from Ravel Morrison in the 16th minute, Junior Flemings in the 43rd and Jamal Lowe in the 69th overturned Yannick Wadshut's equaliser in the 20th minute. The match was in danger of not coming off as the senior team demanded the resignation of Jamaica Football Federation's General Secretary Dalton Wint in light of the faulty travel arrangements which saw the team arrive a day later than scheduled from Suriname after their 1-1 draw in their League A opener. Wint has tendered his resignation. West Indies and Pakistan are now in play in the first one-day international in Malton. The three ODIs are part of the Super League cycle and both sides are eager to secure crucial points to directly qualify for the ICC Men's Cricket World Cup 2023. Just yesterday, it was announced that Windy's all-rounder Kimo Paul had been called up for the series thanks to his performance in the recent first-class tournament, where he was the leading fast bowler and second-highest wicket-taker overall. He ended five matches with 20 wickets at an average 22.8 runs per wicket. Paul had best figures of 6 for 50 and was also among the leading all-rounders with 169 runs, including a highest score of 73. On Monday, the West Indies arrived in Moulton after the impressive 3-0 series win in the Netherlands and the captain, Nicolas Perrin, was in good spirits. Perrin says that the regional boys have adjusted despite the change in weather. Obviously, coming from Netherlands, from the cold to the heat, it's around 45 degrees. Um, today we had our first training session and it went really good. Um, obviously, uh, we trained at four. The weather wasn't it wasn't that bad. It was very windy, so we really appreciated that. Um, but for now, it's okay. You know, tomorrow the game starts at four, so we'll be at the ground a bit earlier. So, you know, hopefully it doesn't affect us. Um, you know, coming from the Caribbean, it's quite similar. So, I think we'll be all right. 
Netball Jamaica will have the services of Australian high-performance coach Robert Wright starting later this month as it looks to begin its center pass program. Wright is expected to spend six months in Jamaica during which time he will be working with local coaches and umpires amongst other things. Meanwhile, Netball Jamaica was also the recent recipient of Australian $20,000 or approximately 2.2 million Jamaican from the Australian High Commission towards its center pass program focusing on a technical enhancement. The center pass program will will make stops in all 14 parishes, starting with Portland. And that's the news on PBC Jamaica. Remember to follow us on all our social media pages at PBC Jamaica. Thanks for watching.